I think... Everywhere. ...that we have two people that, that have done this. <laughs> they have taken a book, and these are normal people. What we're going to do, what John is talking about, uh, we have talked about the free energy before and all of that technology. And during the course of the last week, we found two very, well, they found us, really, two very skilled people that took the very basic information that John has published and we've talked about on the show. Tom, I think you're familiar with this. Yeah. Uh, we're going to call them just Roy and Bill. That, they, that is them, or Ray and Bill, that's their first names. We'll talk to them for a second. And they have done it. Uh, and they are weather, rather well-placed engineers. They know exactly what they're talking about, and they understand what John is talking they about. They get 20 gold stars for 20 me. gold stars. And we'll, ta we'll talk to them in just a few moments. Right now, you're in a conversation with John Bedini and with Tom Bearden. We're talking about the bright side of scalar electro electromagnetics. It is probably the great hope, the greatest hope that we have seen in a long time. I'm Bill Jenkins. There's some objection to it. Yet presents an open mind, and uh, as the name of your show is, yes. and uh, therefore uh, finally uh, comes around uh, once he sees the facts. I mean, the facts can't be denied. And the third, of course, is they that would accept anything, you know, no matter what you tell them. So those <laughs> those kind aren't so good either. But uh, there are three different, three definite basic types. Well, you know, you live in a uh, a rather advanced. Uh, I can't get into your background. You've asked for that uh, anonymity. Uh, but a, a, a group, your peer group, are very advanced people. You're involved in um, some of our leading organizations here where science is supposed to be what they're about. Mm -hmm. And whenever you show them, here it is. And yet they're going to they're take question with you, even though they're looking at it, working, because it doesn't fit the mold of the book they have back in their office. Does that say too much for us here? That, that's exactly what happens quite often. Yeah, I'd like to point out here that, that the books that, that we have are only the ones that John and Tom and all mention every time that they're on your program. Yes. They always tell you that they go to the Tesla Book Company, these are available. So we said, well, let's get them. And they're very inexpensive. They cost about the price of a magazine or something like that. They're, they're not expensive to get. So we sent the Tesla books. Oh, we got the, the books, and it looked impossible at first, but then... So we said, well, let's have an open mind, and we wanted to try it. Good for you. All right, now... And so, I was one of the ones that was skeptical, may I add. <laughs> but uh, there were some things that were difficult for us. We didn't feel that we could uh, uh, build one of the special uh, generators, so we said, well, now, why can't we really uh, do the same thing with just the electronic logic? Now, let me say also that the... The level of electronics that we have is nothing very deep. It's things like you might read about in a popular electronics magazine. And the science that's in it is something that you might uh, read in Scientific American. It's something that just any ordinary people can understand. Can you, and, can you wait just a second there, Ray? Yeah. I'm just an ordinary talk show host that's a behind schedule with something very important. <laughs> Call <Okay>. it commercial. <laughs> And I'll be right back with you. We have Bill and Ray on the line talking to John Bedini and Tom Bearden. Bill and Ray are uh, in the electronic industry. They, are, they know their electronics very well. They took these impossible uh, ideas of our, our resident madmen, John Bedini and uh, Tom Bearden, and found out that they work. And it's a fascinating story. So you stay with me. I'll be right back on Talk Radio 79, KABC physicist with, uh, we will say, a rather large corporation who should know better, that on their own time, they took John's book and, and uh, Tom Bearden, who is also with us on the phone from Huntsville, Alabama, and started working with this impossible thing about scalar interferometry that John had been talking about and we had been talking about here on the air. And guys, Bill and Ray, you get five stars. Because on your own, you didn't call me, you didn't call John, you didn't call Tom. You did it, and you found out that, my goodness gracious, it works. Yes, definitely. Ray is the one that uh, eventually got the material. I think he listened to your show, and, uh, well, Ray, you tell him what happened from there. Well, on the show, you remember, uh, Bill, you uh, suggested that you tape it because you're going to probably want to hear it again. And so I did. I taped it, then I shared it with Bill. And if it sounded impossible, 
But you made the impossible come true. But, uh... Well, now, what I'm going to do here... Yeah. We've done it again. We've run up to the 11 o'clock hour. You guys have time to go get a cup of coffee. We want to hear this story totally and completely because we're going to take a break for news. But it's, uh... Some I don't want anybody to miss. And turn on your tapes because you're going to learn a lot of new things in this next hour from John Bedini and Tom Bearden and Ray and Bill on Open Mind. Full scalar interferometry. And it takes many dimensions, from awesome weapons to healing, the likes of which you have never seen, to hearing, the likes of which you have never heard. And the men that are in the forefront of this particular science is uh, in the studio. One of them is John C. Bedini. On the phone from Huntsville, Alabama is Thomas E. Bearden. And also on the phone are two of our peers that live here in Los Angeles that heard us talk about this read the material that John had published and Tom had published, went about in their own spare time, they worked with one of our major corporations, and found out that it was true. I hated to pause in the middle of your story. We have Bill and Ray on the line. Uh, Ray, go ahead and continue. Okay, well, in one of the experiments that John had run and was written in the paper that uh, Ike and Yoder wrote up, mm-hmm. where he took four partially discharged batteries and with no other power input, he had the four batteries recharge themselves while at the same time he was operating a 75 watt quartz light as a load. And they recharged themselves. True. So Bill and I said, well, wh- why use four batteries? Why can't we have one battery recharge itself? And so using the, the uh, really the G field generator system that we simulated by electronic logic circuits, we, mm-hmm. we were, were able to do this. And, uh, and we proved all the, all, all the, the strange things that, that John had talked about and how everything works backwards. Of the, uh, but that part of it, I guess, is where Bill is really better qualified to, to explain that. The Bill, whole world of electromagnetics seems to be upside down, doesn't it? Uh, exactly, yeah. Go ahead, Bill. Well, you see, the, the, the interesting part about the whole thing is as I read through the literature, uh, which took me uh, a couple of months, I guess, <laughs> it's pretty complicated stuff, uh, the very first thing that dawned on me, uh, that grabbed me, really, was uh, Bearded, Tom, Tom Bearden's explanation of uh, a zero vector. All right, now Tom's on the line, Tom. Are you still there, right? Yes, I'm here. Okay, you got Tom on the line. Yeah, your explanation of a zero vector, uh, once it sunk in, once I understood what you meant by scalar, what everybody's talking about by scalar, I was astounded at the absolute incredible possibilities of such a thing. Uh, it turns your electromagnetics into gravity. Basically. Yes, it's absolutely astounding, uh, the, the implications that's involved here. Now, so, at any rate, uh, I also moved on then to uh, uh, John Bendini's uh, uh, G-Field generator there and uh, took a look at exactly what he was doing with that, or tried to understand exactly what he was doing with that anyway. And that took a while. You think that took a while? I took John with me down to town hall, you know, or prestigious group was about a little over a year ago. That was the, the uh, broadcast that was started. And we demonstrated that down at Town Hall, and we were there till 4 or 5 o'clock in the afternoon, because yeah, we there were did. people from the aerospace industry and everybody there that just didn't believe it. Now, I think you had 10 100-watt lights. Yes, I did. Plus a 2,500-watt uh, No, heater. I had a 600-watt quartz heater and 10 100-watt light bulbs. And I lit all that up with a 500-watt motor. That, that's all the motor could draw, because it was not a capacitive run motor. I want you to know, guys, that there were people under the table looking for hidden weapons. Well, <laughs> here's the, the, the whole thing that the people are going to have to understand is that that, that G-Field generator represents one thing. It represents a zero. It's when the iron comes into the magnetic fields and instead of cutting them it is just charged and it becomes neutral to the magnetic field and when it comes out of the magnetic field it comes out with one hell of a lump and that's the energy that we want to use that's the energy we want to burn because the opposite effect happens then instead of uh, putting drag on a motor like a normal generator would it will speed up the motor because the motor has no load to drive. 
and the harder the load is to drive, the faster the motor wants to spin. Well, that's backwards to everything that we know. Does that uh, pretty well go along with what you and uh, Bill, that you and Ray found out in your in your work? Very much so. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. I would, as I understood that, I thought, well, now how can we? You see, one of the problems that that we had as a group is that we didn't have a machinist or a shop or lathes around that we could manufacture or try to duplicate this this kind of a system. And being more involved in electronics than anything else, we said, well, can we do it electronically with only one battery? Apparently, it has been done electronically before, but never quite that way. So You didn't go solid state on this, did you? Uh, essentially, we did. Yes, I'm afraid we did. You get 12 stars. <laughs> 25. <laughs> 25 stars. Well, it wasn't an easy chore. Once we figured out, after we went through a couple of uh, uh, failures there, uh, once we figured out uh, exactly how to design a uh, rather unique type of a voltage doubler, uh, we... Uh, <laughs> We were doing just fine uh, with a plug. See, we had a plug in the wall that would run our solid states, mm -hmm. and our solid states would control the, the, the actual uh, charging of the battery and the lighting of the bulbs and whatever. But, of course, it didn't make for a very good demonstration with this thing plugged in the wall, so we decided to uh, make the whole thing self-contained. Bless your heart. Well, that's where we ran into trouble, because IC chips do not like scalar. It just doesn't like it. There's you know, no matter of fact, I think I had to dig out of that. Are, you, are, those, are those your CMOS chips? Well, we were using TTL. Uh -huh. They don't like scalar? No, 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 none of it likes scalar. As a matter of fact, I think you had to dig an LED out of the ceiling once. It was, <laughs> it was rather difficult. I had a few myself. <laughs> yes. However, uh, we did finally figure out a way to do it, to isolate the, uh, the integrated circuitry from the scalar effect. And then it became a rather impressive little device, sitting there with nothing but this battery on it, battery bubbling away, charging just fine. You'll blow up that battery if you're not careful. If you're not careful. And uh, one of the interesting things that we had is a light bulb blowing. Now, yes. <laughs> yeah, I can give you a little, little interesting uh, piece of information here for the technocrats that may be listening. There are a few, I think. I'm sure. Uh, let's see, we had a 4 ampere hour moped motorcycle battery. We had the smallest lead acid battery that we could get. Yeah, the reason for that being is because any effect that we would obtain would probably be over quickly. We wouldn't have to wait around all day for something to happen. The motorcycle battery had only had 4 ampere hours, and if it was going to die, it wouldn't take all day to do it. This was the, uh, the con this is the, the, the theory behind it anyway. They sure will die quick when the thing won't start and you keep trying to kick it over the end. <laughs> That's true, that's true. And uh, let's see, then we had a 4-amp a four a four amp light bulb at uh, 12 volts. That's about 48 watts. And, and uh, we ran the whole thing for 11 hours. Now, 11 if, hours on a 4-hour battery. Yeah, well, it didn't stop no. then. We turned it off. No, it was you a just got tired of it. <laughs> no, it was a 1-hour battery. It was a 1-hour battery. Right. Mm. You realize that that would have gone on, you know, until something just broke? Uh, affirmative, it would have. Uh, it's a total of uh, 44 ampere hours out of a 4 ampere hour battery uh, and when we shut it off. And then, of course, we thought, well, we, this thing seems to be working pretty well. Uh, let's charge the battery up conventionally all the way to the top with a conventional charger and uh, see how long uh, see, and start this whole thing over make some real notes, some real scientific records on the thing. We need some data, you know, to... Uh to draw some conclusions from. Right. So well, then, it took us... It a very interesting thing occurred. The battery, by the, on as far as the hydrometer was concerned, it was a small lead acid, and it seemed to tell us that it was, uh, was discharging. However, it, the light bulb would still light if you put it right across the battery. Amazing. A very interesting thing. It took uh, 16 hours at 2 amps to bring the thing back up to what the hydrometer called 10% charge. Nevertheless... It's running away. Nevertheless, it runs... It runs just beautifully. It's just unbelievable, the thing. Now, one of the demonstrations I gave to some of the technical people in the area was uh, an amp meter in series with the light bulb, digital type, mm -hmm. a digital voltmeter across the light bulb, and a tectonic oscilloscope across the light bulb. You're getting, you're getting sophisticated, I'm saying. <laughs> a little bit. Now, when the thing was de detuned, when it wasn't properly operating... The light bulb glowed very, very dimly, and we saw about two or three volts on a light bulb and about 40, 46, 47 milliamps of uh, current. And the oscilloscope showed us the waveform 
going to the light bulb at the same voltage level as the digital meter did. And then we bring the thing up into in tune, tune it to the battery's resonant frequency or subharmonic of the battery's resonant frequency for the people out there that uh, like those things. And uh, when this occurred, the bulb glowed full bright, the voltage went to zero, the scope straight line, and the amperage went to zero. <laughs> but the bulb kept on burning. Right. Yeah, very brightly, yes. That's it, guys. That's, That's exactly, exactly right. the way it does it. Now, where was the energy coming from, uh, Bill and Ray? <laughs> well, now that can get complicated. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Bendini certainly knows, and Tom certainly knows, and <laughs> I think I know. <laughs> well, would you mind if I bring somebody well, else in on the, cor- one uh, on question the conversation? Here, Bill. One yeah. question. Yeah, go ahead. So it is absolute proof that we have to have something in front of our eyes to believe it, right? Oh, there is absolute proof of that. But I couldn't in, tell re- in, in reality, all our instrumentation shows zero, and the light glows. Right. That's affirmative. The instrumentation is pretty much a linear stuff, and the scalar being nonlinear isn't picked up by the instrumentation. It goes right through it. So yes. we've, got, we've right. got a lot of work to do on detecting scalar, don't we? Right. Very much so. Well, I have uh, on the line another gentleman who is with another one of our rather large organizations who I think may have something to add to this. Do you want to listen to uh, another independent uh, investigator like yourself? Sure. All right. We'll bring him home in just a moment. I'm Bill Jenkins. It's Open Mind. And we're talking to John Bedini, who's given us free energy, who's given us a whole new way to listen to music, who's given us a whole new way to stay healthy. Tom Bearden is with us, who is working very, very closely with John. He's down in Huntsville, Alabama. We have Bill and Ray, and we'll bring Ron on right after this. Hello, Ron. Oh, hello, Bill. You've been listening to all of this? Uh, I sure have, all but the first 20 minutes, and I can blame it on my two friends. i got a bone to pick with them. All right, uh, you're right. John, John and Tom, since we're giving out stars tonight, I think you've got to take two away from these two guys. Uh-oh, what'd they do now? They didn't notify me they were going to be on uh, open line tonight. Oh. <laughs> can you believe that? Oh, Ron, I thought I did. <laughs> <laughs> you have 40 stars, Ron. <laughs> okay, John. All right, Ron. Go ahead, go ahead. Ron, I don't. You, I know you want to. I don't know whether you want to mention the who you're with, but I know that you have. Although you and I haven't had a chance to meet yet, that no, you have yeah. been deeply involved in uh, the work of John and Tom. Uh, but you're certainly highly qualified to make it a judgment, and you've been working with it. What is your estimation of it all? Well, I'd like to throw uh, since the uh, two gentlemen on their last uh, mentioned that uh, they're still with us. Things. Uh, don't always work the way they're supposed to. Uh, they left out one little item that I was discussing with John and Tom a short time ago. Certain types of electrolytic capacitors uh, do not like scalar waves either. Uh, they actually explode in just a few seconds' of time. And uh, this is not due to over voltage, over current, or anything, anything else. Uh, uh, the chemistry in the electrolyte of certain types of capacitors that are normally used in normal uh, like electronic circuits uh, uh, just completely uh, refuse to function in the, in the normal manner when, when a scalar signal is present. I think uh, John can confirm that, and I know, uh, I know Tom is very much aware of this. Have you found that out, Bill and Ray? Well, well we, we haven't right. experienced that yet. We, it goes right through a capacitor. <laughs> <laughs> but there are certain times it will blow up. Mm-hmm. Uh, some of the highest grade talons are, are, the, are the worst. Yeah. And it's almost dangerous because a person could get hurt. Uh, it only takes a few seconds. And they, when they do explode, they, they explode in a fashion that is not normal to any uh, electrical type explosion, such as uh, anyone knowing uh, the result of a capacitor exploding or blowing up due to over voltage or, or whatever the case may be. Uh, there's usually a string of tin foil dielectric stuff that uh, spreads itself all out all around you when this happens. When there's a scalar potential involved and a capacitor explodes, everything internally within that capacitor, virtually every atom, ignites simultaneously. The end result is that you find there's just fragmentations of dust particles. You have a little mushroom cloud, right? Exactly. And it's stuck uh, on everything in the in the immediate area. 